Welcome to episode six of the Critical Coach podcast. If you want to support what I'm doing, head over to thecriticalcoach.com forward slash shop and check out some merch. Uh, If you enjoy the podcast, follow it on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, or give it five stars on Apple Podcasts. This episode is a conversation with Dan Minton, a veteran of 30 plus years in the Australian Army. He served as a soldier and an officer, a member of Armoured Corps and Army Aviation. As a civilian, he's been involved in the analysis and development of vocational training and currently works as the project director for Symbotics Innovations. We discuss vocational training, higher education, and I get a crash course in the threats and opportunities of digital transformation, otherwise known as Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I mean, not to be too reductive about it, but you sort of got a nice span across development and then in one space and then implementation on the other with the training, you know, as far as the development goes and the implementation on the operations side of things. And I guess that's probably continued to some extent in Civvy Street as well. Yeah, it's uh, certainly in my... um the vast bulk of the work that I did in corporate life in Civvy Street was in the analysis phase of skills. So it was about why things happen, not so much how. Um, so the how becomes the implementation phase in a training sense. So uh, my role was right at the very start is what's next? Um, you know, what is your job now? What does it look like in the future? And, in fact, to a large extent, a few of my jobs inside Army were like that which were, what are we doing now? What is capability required in the next few years? So much of my skills were developed through the analysis component, which is unpacking skills, analysing what are we doing now, what is the required standard, and what are the influences to change? Uh, That's pretty much been a theme at the very least since about 2007. So for the last almost 15 years, I've lived in a world of analysis, so unpacking skills, task analysis, um, quite arcane processes, but basically pulling apart a job and just in the job down to skills, knowledge and attitude and then finding how does that job go next or where does that job go next and what is the best way to get there. So some of the things we've done over the years with, I won't say we've turned mathematical, but some of them can be analysed through maths, frequency, uh, importance, subjective analysis, subjective analysis. But when you, go, when you go back into the application phase of it, when you look at how it's trained and then how it's delivered in training and how it's used, what you come down to is you look at someone who's been trained out of the current training system, whether it's national or defence, then you ask yourself, why are they doing that? Not so much how why i live in a world of whys so when you ask questions and there's um and you use the term reductive which is good uh (laughs) there are there are many decisions well i mean there's some decision making processes that lead you down that path about why and one of the ones which is i won't say famous but quite useful is five whys so if you ask the question why five times like a child eventually you'll get to the point where you run out of answers if when you get to the fifth why or fourth or fifth why and you don't have any further questions, you've probably found a ground truth. So much of what I do, even today on a daily basis as doing admin and staff work, is why. Why are we doing that? 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 Down to the point where you go, now I know the story. And then you sort of reverse engineer it. So it's almost like trying to find... Uh, the first principles of what the problem is so that you can work your way back through it from that basic state. Yeah, precisely. And even even beyond that, when you go from first principles, I'm to the point of what is the first principle? Yeah. Why are we why are we doing that function? Why is a human performing that task in regardless of industry? And that's quite a that's an incredibly difficult task to do, um, and that that has taken me literally years to get to the point where I can I won't say intuitively because I'm not going to be a smart ass about it, but 
but I'm, I'm used to pulling apart these problems and asking why, 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 why to people like, oh, fucked if I know. Then you go, all right, it's clearly that point. But everything we do to a large extent within defence or outside is anchored on a task. You do things, you, but you do things for the reason. So the question is, what's the reason? Is it a rule? Is it a process? Is it a procedure? Is it best practice? Is it uh, corporate memory? Is it, you know, is it a social skill? Um, so when you look at why we do things, you know, why doctrine evolves inside defence, how offence and defence works to why you wire things certain ways inside electrotechnology, at some point there's always a why. So hopefully there isn't a death at the, end, at the end of it. You know, why is don't do that because you'll hurt yourself. The other side of it is we think that, and that the past tense is really fucking easy because you can go, don't do that because bad things happen. When you extrapolate that into what's next, that that really becomes an art. It moves from being a skill to an art where you have to forecast what are the likely effects of decision. Um, and then much like weather, over time the error or the margin widens. Yeah. So you know, if I train if I tra- sorry Sam, if I train you now, what's a good example? An apprenticeship. If I train you now. Over a four-year period, I culminated a series of skills and you're awarded a certificate. How do I know that that point in time is going to be effective for the rest of your working life? Do you ever get – does that mean – I guess the question I'm, I'm sort of – that comes to mind hearing that is what? how often do you come across a what and a why that don't actually marry up together? And more what? often than not. Yeah. More often than not. Yeah, yeah, shit, yeah. Um, so over, in fact, it's almost equally, it's almost equally balanced between what I've experienced inside defence, what I experience outside, and then coming back into defence. Because what I've found is human problems remain human problems. Um, so people look at problems the same way regardless of context. So the first thing we do is we try to change our behaviour automatically. We, we Like it's a human thing. That, that hurt, that didn't work, it, there's an instant result. So the feedback loop, when you're very young and when you're very inexperienced, it's very, very short. So the learning loop is very, very tight. As you get older with more experience, you get to extrapolate your decisions. So you get to look forward in time and ask yourself, what if I did this and this and this? This is likely to happen. And then over time you will experience it and then you confirm your bias or your decision or your justification. But I've found that most people try to solve things through a rule. So we try and capture error through rule. When you look at things, you usually see things through the lens of negative bias, which is don't do things, um, which is a very, very shit way to learn, to so, be honest. So is that like loss aversion where, you know, if I gave you a 95% probability that you'll gain $10 versus a 95% probability that you'll lose $10, you're always going to avoid the one where you lose over the one where you might get $10. And in order Correct. to overcome the gain, the probability has to be really, really high. And in and in vocational terms or skills terms, it's the ROI. It's the return on investment. What is the uh, some of some of the bullshit analogies you will hear is is the juice worth the squeeze? You know, the amount of effort I pour into a topic or task or effort or duration of training is it worth the benefit to the business? to the capability or to the outcome, and in your terms, and you and I have been uh, invested in our discussions about, you know, squeeze and juice over effort, physical effort, physical movement, efficiency, they're identical concepts. They really are. The amount of effort that you put into coaching someone to change their physical behaviour versus effort or output versus 
um, can be measured at some point, they don't get any better. It's the same when you're trying to change a skills base over time. At some point, you have to accept that that is enough. They will, we've given them a solid base. They can use their workplace experience to solve the problems, contingency skills, in competency terms, and they will be able to resolve the 5% or 10% that they don't know. So in, in learning terms or educational terms, even back to your first instructional period, you take a learner from what he knows to what he doesn't know to what he does know. So known, unknown, known. And depending on how you pitch it, the duration between known and known, i.e. the unknown, can be extensive. In education terms it is, degrees are extensive. In vocational skills terms, they're short. They're short learning loops. They, but they are cumulative learning loops. Picture a, picture a wheel with a fucking uh, a painted dot on it that rotates. But as it rotates, the wheel will move another rotation. So your learning loop in a short-term learning loop, you will gain the same amount of information, but you'll always have a foot on the ground um, sooner. Picture education or higher ed as a track on an APC where a trackpad on the top doesn't touch the ground again for a longer time. And that is, i.e., at the end of a degree or at the end of a semester or at the end of a, you know, instructional period, whereas skills-based learning is very shorter. It's what do you need now and does um, what's a really good analogy that a lot of people understand? Um, sparkies. The first time that they understand how a circuit works, power comes in, power goes through a wire, power goes to a switchboard, there is a switch, then, it, then it's distributed. So you can learn that relatively quickly. It's underpinned by maths, you know, how does how do maths work, how does spark work. But at some point, once you understand how the circuit works and then how resistance works and how energy works, then it doesn't fucking matter. Then you start to build more circuits as long as you abide by the principles. But if you're in education doing a Bachelor of Engineering, you'd have to know that plus other layers, plus other layers, plus other layers, plus design principles. But you wouldn't really know if you're effective until the first time you designed a house. Whereas as an electrician, he would know he's successful the first time he flicked the switch. So the learning loops are identical but extended. Now, the sparky is the same as learning to shoot a rifle. You've shot a rifle. You've probably got cross rifles. If you haven't, you've probably attempted it. But you know that the marksmanship principles can be taught to a soldier at Kapuka, but they are identically applied to a sniper. It's just the a period of experience is extended. Now, when you overlay that with a question of why the principles exist, there's a, res there's a reason why reductive reasoning works for, for example, physical action. At some point, you can actually distill a physical action down to principles. There are four key principles. There is no planet, uh, sorry, there's no country on the planet that is yet to argue with how you would hold a weapon and fire the action to apply fire. Why? Because the human movement is identical, regardless of colour, nation, creed. You know, if you breathe, you aim, physical effect, apply fire, but they will all tell you that their snipers are different. So this is, I, I was going to ask you about this later, but we're sort of having this conversation now. Um, are you familiar, have you ever listened to Lex Friedman's uh, AI podcast? No, I haven't. Okay, so Lex Friedman's, uh, I think he's now a former professor of um, artificial intelligence at MIT and he's interviewing Jim Keller. I'm not exactly sure what Jim's you know, title or qualification would be, but he's involved in um, computer engineering and developing software and all that sort of stuff. Um, and Jim says this thing about, do you understand the difference between a recipe versus understanding? If I give you a recipe for bread, you can execute that sequence of tasks and you'll end up with bread at the end. 
But if you want to understand bread, you need to understand supply chains, farming, chemistry, biology, physics. And so if you want to do something um, that you already know how to do, executing a stack of recipes is a really efficient way to do that. But if you come up against a problem that someone hasn't already solved for you and that you have a recipe for, now you're in real big trouble and you need understanding in order to bridge that gap. So I'm just wondering if there's any parallel between that and what you're talking about with vocational education and then higher education. Yeah, there there are certainly parallels in vocational um, simply because if you perform a series of tasks enough across a slightly broader range of variables, your operating environment, at some point your base will be solid enough that by the time you get to the weird shit, um, your base is enough that you will have seen, for example, to you, to extrapolate on that analogy, you'll have seen all variations of the recipe. Um, so if a recipe, and bread is a really good one, once again, there are so many variations of bread that still create bread that, in essence, bread is three ingredients. Um, but I could, in fact, technically two. I could do it with flour and water. But if you vary up to four and three and whatever and shape and time and manipulation of the ingredients and resting and whatever, you can fundamentally change the output changed on your experience with the input. So I have flour. Now, do I have brown flour, rice flour, quinoa flour, self-raising flour? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So your experience with one ingredient, and then it then becomes very, do I use water, do I use coconut milk, do I use beer, do I use a percentage mix? Great. Do I bind it? Do I mix it? Do I knead it? Do I, you know, and then you bind the ingredients, then do you rest it, do you immediately cook it? And then from there is, so what you get is a very, very strong base of experience, which is vocational skills. Once you train someone to a level of performance that are competent in the workplace, they will experience. At about the two to four year mark, they start to have a broad base and they start to understand that they can solve problems predicated on the base. I've seen this before under these conditions. Um, So what you end up with is expertise developed in a quite narrow field to some extent and you get an output. Higher education takes a significant longer period of time to generate similar effects simply because it is knowledge base. If you go through a knowledge period without the application of skills, the humans cannot do that. You can't draw on eight years of knowledge with one year of experience and get an answer. It's just not possible because the way to do that is like I and I could read about sniping for eight years and know the theory of the marksmanship principles, but I couldn't be a sniper. But if I knew the marksmanship principles um, and then practised them for eight years, I'd become a sniper. Um, So what you find is uh, the distinction between a vocational outcome and an education outcome is significantly different in time. They they, They will relatively, they'll catch up at the eight to 10 year mark, when you get a skills and experience base start to manifest. Because you'll find with a guy with the skills will almost do an inverse pyramid. He'll come in with a skill base and then he'll go, I need to know more. What else can the recipe do? But the dude with the fucking expertise of everything about bread, um, but he will narrow that, but he narrows it over a longer period of time. I'm just wondering with uh, that longer gestation period. I mean, my, I mean, I'm coming from someone who's basically you get taught something and then you know you go outside and you practice it or you practice it the next day. Um, just wondering if that lack of, uh, you know, if you're at university for three, four years, do you lack that ability to just, or potentially lack that ability to just get stuck in and have a go and solve the problem by 
doing it rather than, you know, sort of sitting back and thinking about it for too long. And then you get in there and you go, oh, it doesn't work. So you're talking about two fundamental issues here, an education for education's sake, which is knowledge for knowledge, or an education that means to manifest in a job. So in order to Um, be able to do something with it rather than just parrot knowledge. Correct. So if you're going to apply knowledge, the way it works is you must practice you must practice the application. The longer a period of time between application of knowledge, the weaker your skill base becomes. It is literally like no it's reading and how to do bread now and in a, in four weeks' time having a crack not using the book. Versus the dude who who might have got a 10 minute or you know a soldier's five bread. Uh, yeah, sorry, flour, water, heat, mix it together, but then spends the next 30 days practising damper. Who's got the better result in 30 days? The dude who knows everything about chemistry over an eight-hour instruction period or the dude who got the soldiers five but then practised it for 30 times? So people talk Which has got the longer experience base. Yeah. Uh, people talk about, like, the art versus science um, of yep. doing something. I'm just wondering, in, in that context, is the art sort of the... Um, intuition skill that you developed based on trial and failure and then being forced to go back and reassess your choices rather than going back to a book and saying, hang on, did I do step A, B, C, D? you sort of forced to grapple with the problem differently. Correct. So the, once again, these problems are identical regardless of context. So human behaviour is human behaviour. Whether I'm teaching a new soldier to march or attempting to develop a skill base for quite high end, some of the some of the arcane shit that I've written in the last few years would blow people's minds. But the concepts are the same. I have to lead people through a pathway of skills to it's almost like telling a story. See one, do one, like this, do that. It's exactly how how kids learn in the first 12 months. Yeah, so it's that and pattern also, recognition. And also change that behavior. Yeah, yeah, it's pattern recognition. It's exactly right. You reinforce the pattern enough to reward behaviour. Some of it's intrinsic, which is success. I needed to pick up the weight. I needed to shoot the duck. I needed to create perfect damper based on what I was shown. After a period of time, once you get to the perfect result, that's where you get a one-star Michelin fucking chef who does pastry by feel because... The look, texture, feel and smell is so ingrained through his pattern, he's done it enough times, he no longer needs to look. Yeah. That is that is intuitive behaviour because at some point he can, like if you, I can actually paint a picture and if your listeners were there, could you imagine putting um, uh, flour and water together, rolling it in your hands, at some point knowing when to stop? There are two ingredients. We've all picked it up. We've done it with mud. We've done it with dirt. We've done. We've probably made Play-Doh. We've all probably maybe had a crack at scones or bread. The two ingredients are so subtle that at some point the master gets to the point where he, he knows when to stop. And then, then he puts it in the heat, you know, it applies the heat ratio and all the rest of it. But they're quite interesting Things because the difference between a fucked up piece of you know burnt scone and something that is light and fluffy is no longer just the recipe. Is exactly as you said. It comes to a point where the um, you could have it at a higher temperature or lower temperature, but if you're an artisan, you would smell it. Like you would know. Well, that's the that's the not just a visual cue. I could smell that it it smells different, so I would stop. So that that then becomes a and you can't learn um, about that by reading a no, book. You got to get in there cannot, and have a go. Correct. You cannot learn that. You cannot learn shoulder feel on a rifle. You cannot learn um, all of those things about the subtleties of expertise. But it's all predicated on this, like this, do that base. That and then practice and pattern recognition over time. So there is a. There is a strong role for vocational skills because shit needs to be done now versus ed- an educational base 
which needs it needs to be done now, but it needs to be done as an expert in four years' time. Okay. Earlier you were talking about, you know, finding out, you know, what's going on now, but what's coming down the pipeline, what's next. Um, help me understand what digital transformation is. What an outstanding question. Um, normally I would dominate this conversation for the next six to 12 months, um, but we <laughs> won't. Um, so this has been uh, an overwhelming focus of my efforts uh, probably for the last four years, I suppose. So the digital transformation of work or more intrinsically of our society has been ongoing probably for the last 10 years. In fact, to be honest, if you want a defining point, at the first time that we got um, touch smartphones is the fundamental shift between uh, pre-industry 4.0 and now. Because with touch smartphones, we are intuitively engaging with data. So the human-machine interface has moved from, you know, thumb interface. As soon as Google mastered voice recognition and touch interface, um, we've moved into using data, not seeking data. So it's a push-pull argument. So does that mean, just to clarify before we go further, is that like a layer of abstraction has been removed from the process that we can interact with um, data in a way that you don't need to be super technically literate in order to get involved? So they have, they Apple particular. So Apple have demonstrated that the human machine interface can be, uh, I won't say dumbed down, made so intuitive that preschool children can use it. So it is feasible to use visuals, flat screen visuals, to create an interface that children with limited knowledge of the world can interface with. So it is feasible. So you can interact with the cyber physical environment as a toddler, and they do. If anybody begs to differ, ask any person on the planet in the last three months how they're entertaining their child. Um, so we, we live in an era where the human-machine interface is primarily both visual and verbal. There's very little touch screen, and if you do, it's because you choose to. But so you don't have is to. that like haptic feedback and that's sort of you can't. haptics. Yep. So haptics is the look, listen, and feel of a machinery. You know, does it represent your environment? That's a simulation concept. But does it? But does it look, listen, and feel like your environment? Does it replicate the environment? That's a simulation approach. But the human machine interface in the industry 4.0 is quite interesting because at the moment it is stuck. It's not embedded. It's well, if it is, it's in, in it's a minuscule of environment. So you and I, for example, are inter interacting through a human machine interface, but I happen to be using an external device. We're using a data connection and I'm using a camera. The next level of this device is may well be embedded in my eye. Like there might be a CMOS chip that is feeding the data signal from you at your end um, through my eye. And anybody who begs to differ needs to understand that CMOS chips and nerve and brain interaction has been around for about a decade um, and is capable now. We've, we've made the blind being able to see. As soon as you understand how the data signal goes to the brain, then you can bypass the visual cortex. So we're not there yet for a whole shit ton of reasons. But the cyber physical systems means we are comfortable quite routinely, and once again, the last three months have demonstrated the globe now has to adjust to this environment. The interaction isn't any more or any less than in person. And in many instances, once again, it might be the 90% solution. You can, you can look at me, you can hear me, and if we've had physical interaction, you know it's me. So you're still creating a, an experience in your head that we've discussed it. You, you can hear my voice and all the rest of it. But we're not there. I'm not a metre and a half apart. I can't touch you and feel you, but it's close. 
But that's an example of the digital transformation of our interaction. Something as simple as communication skills are now changing. Now, we, as I said, this is not new. We've had this ability for a decade. So that was the, that was the first thing we noticed. If you relied on communication skills to be face-to-face, um, then you're wasting time and effort because you can, you can achieve 90% of your outcome through these means. So, for example, I, I have a, a DVA rehab program once a week and mine's done through telehealth. So I have a guy who, who I use an application. He dials me in. I put him on my phone in front of the machine that I'm transiting on and I have a Bluetooth earpiece and he coaches me remotely. I don't think that it's any less of an effect. I'm still getting coached. I'm still getting picked up pointers. Whether I agree with it or not is incidental. He is still, he's in my ear and I can see him on a small screen and he can see me. It's limited in its effect, but it's close. But but for the purposes of the experience, I got trained, he got paid, and the and you know the transaction was closed. Right, and so there's no required a transport anywhere. Um, you know, so you save. I, I was so uh, I might be about a month ago now. I was talking to um, a couple of other guys on the podcast, Al Bottomore and Joe Matthews, um, about how the lockdown has affected how they coach people Um, and at that point they weren't allowed to do outside training anymore so it was all video conferencing based Um, and what was they said was really interesting is that um, for the introverts that they coach there isn't there hasn't really been much of a change for them um, in the process but for extroverted clients of theirs that they were being much more conscious and careful in what they were doing because they didn't have someone there watching over their shoulder. They didn't have the distractions. There was, it was like there's there was a hidden value um, in almost like the awkwardness of the medium um, that actually gave them something that they probably wouldn't have known was there if they weren't forced to grapple with it, uh, like we all have been over the last few months. That's a very interesting forward. Sorry, I just lost um, you for the last 10 seconds. Sorry, mate. Um, I just said it's, it's an interesting point. Um, the There will be subtleties in approach in a digitally transformed uh, training environment precisely for that reason. So, the, for example, the facilitation of meetings will have to change. So virtual meetings, the actions and behaviours of the moderator and the participants have to be disciplined and they have to be um, almost like the analogue phone system where you couldn't easily talk over each other. That's exactly so, what I noticed in the last podcast is that if you, you you need to treat conversation differently, ask a question and then try as hard as you can to shut up until you get the answer. Otherwise, you just get this convoluted mess and no one hears anything. Correct. So one of the advantages of me leaving defence, for example, and working, like I've, I've been doing what you're seeing here, that background, I've done this for the last almost six years. So I've got very familiar through Skype for Business and other mediums of doing the you talk, me talk, you me. But once again, that I reverted back to my old time as an APC driver, which is fucking intercom and radio. You talk, me talk. Message, receive, transmit. So you have to be clear in your communications up front you need to ensure that the listener has received it and then you need to respond. That takes a little bit of time, but it, it practices disciplined communication skills. Now, that's a skill that you can use face-to-face as well as over this medium. Yeah, it seems to so be a much more engaged it. listening process. Correct. You know, and as soon as you start to talk, by the way, I've defaulted to backing off because I've trained myself not to over-talk someone on video because it, it's annoying as fuck. <laughs> um, okay, so digital transformation, what are the – we talked about some of the opportunities um, already, but what else, is, what else is still on the table that we're not taking advantage of and are there any threats 
um, that we need to be aware of? Okay, so let, let's take that as a two-part question. So the first thing, let's talk about what digital transformation is. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm going to bring up some reference material on my, your left, my left, your right. Um, but what this will allow me to do is to talk through what it is. Um, and then we can talk through the extrapolation of principles to other environments. And the reason I'm going to do this is I want to paint a picture for your listeners to understand that advanced manufacturing principles are equally applicable to their role and their job. Awesome. Because once again, the Germans are pretty fucking smart and they've unpacked this to understand how principles work with human and machines. So give me two secs. I'm just going to bring up a web page. We won't record it, but I will talk to it. That's all right. I'll uh, throw a link to it if I can get it. Um, in yeah, the mate. Description. I'll, I'll it through. It's it's a basic Wikipedia, but I know for a fact that the um, uh, the principles are accurate because I've read this source paper from the Germans from 2013. So the principles themselves. So a bit of background. It, digital transformation has been extrapolated from the term of Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So. Industry 4.0 indicates there have been three others, but and there have been, but there have been three others over the last 250 years. So for those who are interested, they can obviously look at both look at the link and do some exploration of where Industry 4.0 comes from. But what will allow you to do is to understand that, in essence, industry is the key word, work, but industry in this context means manufacturing. So the fourth industrial revolution of manufacturing focused on four key principles, and I'll, and I'll talk through them. So the first one is interconnection. The ability of machines, devices, sensors and people to connect and communicate with each other via the Internet of Things or the Internet of People. So let's talk about what that means. It means, so right now, we are connecting through an internet of three things, but we are an internet of people. So there are two humans. They're communicating through a device. So that's interconnection. However, if it was machine talking to machine, that is the internet of things. As soon as there is a human in that loop, it becomes the internet of people. Okay. So sensor-to-sensor transmission is Internet of Things, so data talking to data, and as soon as it is human, it becomes Internet of People. What's a good example? That thing. That's a smart smartwatch. You know, if I tap that. So that is an Internet of Thing, but it's on a human. Now, because the sensor on my wrist can measure my heart rate, my oxygen, my steps, I'm, I become a data node. So I'm now part of the internet of people. Okay? Now, secondly, if people want to get their minds fucking blown, if you carry a smartphone around, you're all part of the internet of people because now the device has a physical location sensor unless you physically turn it off. So what you are is a moving dot in cyberspace. So we know where, like your telecommunications network knows where you are. And if I say the telecommunications network, I mean any person who can access the telecommunications network knows where you are to to a significant level of accuracy. If we use cell resolution, you triangulate it within the cell towers. If you have device location on and provide permission, it's a plus plus or minus 10 metres. So that basically means anyone with a smart device is a node in this enormous network. Correct. There you go. So that's the first principle of Industry 4.0. We are interconnected. So um, what's a really good example that uh, your listeners will understand? For those who've used Google Maps, um, Google owns a secondary application known as Waze. Waze is a fantastic Google-based product that does travel mapping, voice activation, AI-based intuitive, natural, but all it is doing 
is using secondary layers of data about where you are in space. And it overlays that with everything it knows on the vertical layer of information, street, weather, facilities, resources, and humans. It puts the human dot, the wazer, on the other layers. So it's a vertical layer of interconnection. So I know where Sam is if he decides to share his data dot with me through the network. So you can share a ride with someone like Uber and it's simply a mathematical algorithm on where you are and where I am and what is the fastest way to get to me. That's it. That's Internet of Things and Internet of People connected. So that's the first principle of Industry 4.0. We are an inter- interconnected network. Okay, so and that was so number one is interconnection. Interconnection. Gotcha. The second one is information transparency. Um, the transparency afforded by Industry 4.0 provides operators with vast amounts of useful information needed to make appropriate decisions. Interconnectivity allows operators to collect an immense amount of data and information from all points in the map. Like they talk about the manufacturing process. I would, I would suggest the work process rather than manufacturing. So to, to summarise, allows operators to collect immense amounts of data and information from all points in the work process, thus aiding functionality and identifying key areas that can benefit from development and improvement. So information transparency means all data becomes visible to the network. So that is the principle behind big data or open data projects. So if you looked, if you searched on Google for open data, New Zealand government is a, is a good example. Um, there, there's a few governments in the world that are heavily into open data, which means releasing information. So as soon as you get information, whether it's Internet of Things or Internet of People or reports, records, you know, in just information, it gets published and promulgated. So information transparency means unless it's protected by legislation, prohibition, copyright or IP, it gets published. What that means in essence is information then becomes like gold. It's the oil of the new economy. Our data, everything about you, you need to protect because otherwise someone else will use it, buy it, and whatever. There's a really good example. If you download a product or, or an application from Google, if it's free, you're the product. Okay? So I want to reinforce that point to your listeners. If something is free, you are the product. Like Facebook, Twitter. Correct. Which means information transparency. So they're applying the Industry 4.0 principle of information transparency because you gave up your information through your voluntarily ticking the I accept box. So every data point about you, including your movements or location, then gets sold. So they are applying information transparency to you. You think you're being hacked, but in essence you handed over your information and your personal identifiable information to them, Google, Facebook, the government, etc., and vice versa. Mind you, government is very, very unwilling to release its information, as it does, but individuals don't have the powers of the state. So you need to find that to operate in an information economy, you need to give up certain parts of yourself and it's usually your personal information. You're not giving up rights, you're just giving up your data. The thing is that data, when it aggregated with everyone else's, starts to become decision-making. Okay. Which leads me to the next one. Go so it. does that understand? Yeah. Information transparency. Yeah, I've got, a, I've, I've got a question I want to ask you about it, but I think I want to wait until I get to the end of it because it might recontextualise it if I ask it later. Uh, no, all good. Um, just so your listeners are wondering, I'm lubricated by pepper jack. Oh, <laughs> I'm not lubricated by anything, unfortunately. 
That's okay. Don't don't be afraid. It's my, it's, my it's out of necessity, not by choice, unfortunately. So all good. All right. So let's talk about the third the third principle. So the third one, which is my favourite one, to some extent. Well, this one and the next one are my favourite ones. So technical assistance. The ability of the systems to assist humans in decision-making and problem-solving and the ability to help humans with tasks that are too difficult or unsafe. I'll repeat that. The ability of the systems to assist humans in decision-making and problem-solving and the ability to help humans with tasks that are too difficult or unsafe. Now, in real terms, Sam, what do you reckon that is? What is technical assistance in our in our economy? What do we use to manifest technical assistance? To manifest it. Yeah. How is it? How is oh. industry four point manifested through technical assistance? I think it'd be information that is, allows you to see problems that you otherwise wouldn't be able to and get ahead of them. Okay. So what allows us to see problems and Stop and prevent us. Well, I guess what we need. What system have we implemented? We need the last one that we had before, don't we? We need the data. Yep. We need information transparency. Yep. So technical assistance. What is the thing? The number one thing that humans have implemented into their lives that does that that we, to some extent, we will have no control over. I have no idea. I'm drawing a blank. You're saying That's it like okay. it's supposed to be obvious, and I'm missing it. No, 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 no. It's, it is and it isn't. It's artificial intelligence. Okay. It's machine learning. So it's the ability of the software and the systems behind the software to extrapolate decisions, algorithms from the data. So technical assistance means hardware and software systems that do the shit that humans can't do. Gotcha. So it's everything from automatic cars to remote pilot flight control systems to software systems on everything that moves is underpinned by technical assistance. So it's sort of and that algorithmic by, process that we correct. either you know struggle to do individually or collectively. Like the one that comes to mind is weather prediction. Like if you were to do that on paper, it would take you a long, long time. Longer, if you could do it longer at all. than the time it takes. It yeah. would take longer than the time it took for the weather to arrive. Yeah, Correct. yeah, good point. Yeah. So technical assistance in Industry 4.0 means the strong use of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems to make decisions or provide you information to support your decisions that you could not do or is too dangerous to do. Yeah, or so there's a reason another way would be... So I guess another one would be maybe you are a small company... And you don't have the funds to hire a boatload of people to work through this for you, but you might be able to offload that um, iterative process to a neural network and just run through circumstances or just, you know, extrapolate information from the data um, that you don't necessarily need a huge workforce anymore. Correct. Yes, completely. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's... I mean, it sounds simple when you explain it, but it's, I guess once you start to th think deeply about it, it's sort of you just see tentacles going off in every direction and it's sort of like, well, I mean, it almost feels like it's what couldn't it be applied to rather than what are the narrow cases where it works. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. So let's crack on the last one. So already I'm starting to change your mind. I know it. <laughs> well, I didn't know what it was before. No, it's a well. I, I know. I know. I'm making you think. Trust me. Okay. So let's talk about the last principle, which is decentralized decisions. Um, it's the ability of cyber physical systems to make decisions on their own and to perform their tasks as autonomously as possible. Only in the case of exceptions, interferences, or conflicting goals and are tasks delegated to a higher level, in this case, a human. So I'll, I'll summarise that again. It is cyber-physical systems performing the task 
unless they run into a rule that prevents them performing the task, in which case they defer up. Sometimes they might defer up to a high level. So secondary and tertiary AI systems, for example, do that, and same with hardware systems. But sometimes it might be the human and the decision-making loop. You run into a an algorithm branch which requires a heuristic approach from a human to go, these are the this is the baker approach, for example. Mm-hmm. This is the baker going, stop cooking. So why do we suck at implementing this last sort of tenant so much? I mean, you think, at least in Australia, the most obvious example right now is going to be the robo-debt problem. That should yep. not be an algorithm so complicated that no one's come across it before and solved it. And then on the extreme end of the spectrum, you've got Tesla running, pat- like, I think, like parallel patches in their cars and they're testing them live in the background even though they're not actually the running piece of software and the computers are doing most of the iterative process for Tesla or it's at least a significant part of it what is why is there a gap is it just that I, I don't even know what question to ask there is a gap obviously but why is. is it there why are we so crap at going computing we power. know you're not ready to put this out to public yet yep computing power so the Department of Human Services has, has elected to use archaic and fundamentally flawed computing systems to create the RoboDebt algorithm. Shocker. Whereas Tesla has is using a neural network to train the AI in a live environment. So it is generating monstrous amounts of real-time data across its entire network. So if you buy a Tesla, you are an Internet of Thing and Internet of People. So you are real-time training the neural network on how humans behave or how humans behave around the node. So that is the reason why it is intuitively faster to solve the problem because it, it then becomes logarithmic. Mm. If you have, well, fuck it, I, I don't know how many Elon's got, what, 100,000 you know, or more nodes in the Tesla 3s and beyond because, let's face it, he's been out for almost a decade. If you have so many nodes in the network, gathering so much real-time data of position, time, speed, you know, and observational data about decision-making, you are so far beyond human decision-making capability that no one human could be better than what the world's best Tesla 3 could do. That's the point. That's the whole fucking point is the entire neural network is creating a single node that um, averages all of its experience. And it's effectively Robo-debt, teaching itself to be better and getting better yep. at teaching it. Well, maybe not there getting is, better there at is teaching no itself. Human do- yep, there is no human doing this. Yeah. The neural network is doing this. So this brings me back to something you mentioned at the start, the uh, the what and the why. And I say, and I, you know, what happens when the what and the why don't match up. Sticking with the robo-debt issue, it seems like they've gone, we know what we want and why we want it. I'm going to get my what's and why's mixed up here, but I think you'll understand. Um, They know what the problem is that they're trying to solve and that they, you know, want to do it that way for whatever um, reason. It seems like at some point someone should have gone, you know, this... I guess, series algorithmic approach, you can't just put it out on day one and expect it to work. Um, like it, it seems like someone should have gone, no, you're missing, like if you want to do this, you need all these other things that you're not willing to get in order to be successful at it. They, they legitimately, if they had a strong enough network, they could have um, scenario tested this. Yeah. It's genuinely feasible. You could have run multiple variations of the algorithm and, once again, like weather, branching algorithms. So, you know, you've got a known consumer base. So, fuck it, let's call it a million people in the system. At some point you have male and female determinants, then there are age, like all the demographics about so if, let's talk about industry 4.0 principles 
So let's go back to the first one, which is interconnection. What are the data nodes in this fucking decision algorithm? Male, female, aged between 18 to 65, okay? And then you have postcodes overlaid and location. So we know where the scattering or the data nodes are. Then what we do is ask it the question is, uh, fuck it, noting that I'm not coding this thing, are you eligible for a thing? You know, are you eligible for a condition? It's an if and then argument. I'm a male and I'm a female. Yes, I'm eligible. Are you aged between 18 to 65? Yes. Go to the next level. Do you have children? Yes or no? No, branch. Yes, branch B. And then all of those sub-branches get smaller and smaller and smaller because not every there isn't a million fucking 45-year-old single mothers of four, you know, <laughs> That's what I'm saying is at some point you could have fucking used AI to test every conceivable option. It might have taken a little bit of time, but at some point you would have identified the likely gaps. Yeah. Like you would have asked, like, what are your conditions for payment or not not just payment, repayment? You were overpaid. What was the rationale for overpayment? This, this, and this, and then test it against the conditions. It's I mean, fuck, if I, if I had a long enough time and a couple of spikes, I could have probably done the fucking thing in Excel, but <laughs> there, are better, there are better tools. Yeah, so it's, that's, mean, it's and that's the a, thing. It, it seems like that serious. conditional yeah. process. Like when I uh, learnt to write, uh, so the only coding language that I can sort of poorly write in is Java, and it's all sequential. If this happens, then this happens. So for every time that decision tree branches, I have to account for all of it. But my the little I understand of neural networks is that I don't have to account for all of those branches before I run the thing. I'm using the neural network to identify all of the diversity between all of the different nodes and then do something with that data. Yeah, correct. So decentralised decisions, the principle of industry 4.0 that I want to get back to, mm. would have would have led to the AI extrapolating to the point where it couldn't make a decision and the robo-debt decision would have passed to a human on the minuscule amount, not every motherfucker that was on welfare. Yeah. You know, that is the fundamental difference. Now, there's a reason why Elon Musk... And Tesla isn't killing people at the emergency rate. Volume of decision. That's when I say volume, the series of algorithmic decisions that are made and continue to be made almost instantaneously every time the vehicle moves, continues to build a neural network and train it so that it's getting every time your car updates and enhances, it, it's enhancing that condition. If this then that. At some point, that algorithm surpasses fucking F1 drivers. That's the point because the conditions are so refined. If you get enough people driving at 250 kilometres an hour through weaving traffic and you get 200 of them doing it for a million kilometres, eventually you are better than any fucking thing because the computer knows what's coming because it had so many people training it if 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 then and it doesn't forget like we do it can't forget yeah and then get this it repeats itself as it because it removes the human so it iteratively experiences and then can extrapolate so it's almost like corporate so, knowledge without bias over time so in real terms Skynet. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is this is mate, this is the fundamental distinction between human and machine interface. That is, at some point, the decentralized decisions stop becoming decentralized. They become centralized decisions, but not with humans. Oh, okay, so it becomes like a Skynet within within a Skynet. And the thing is, there <laughs> well, there are AIs that make. There's no ifs, no buts. There are AIs that have been made by AIs. We don't know what the code is behind it. Yeah. And not get and get this. 
We don't actually know how many AIs there are on the planet because nobody registers artificial intelligence. You yeah. could write one now. Nobody would ever know. So oh, I'll ask the question I was going to ask before. You meant you talked about um, data being like, you know, the new gold, the new oil. Yep. It almost, especially, you know, you look at what happened uh, with the use of data in um, Brexit and in the US election, it's almost like there's a gold rush on, but it's on a light spectrum that not everyone can see. Like there's an opportunity here with data if you only understand how and why it's valuable. And it seems like there's not enough of us that really grasp the importance of it. And those that do are just running away and running away exponentially faster to the point where it's like, if we don't get onto this soon, are we going to be able to catch up? Or, I mean, you look at, you know, like what's happened with Google and YouTube. They've just grown and grown and grown and grown to the point where they've effectively created a monopoly on it because they've got there so much faster than anyone else. It's uh, it's an interesting point you make. So the... Um What's a good way to describe this? So the most cogent example of Industry 4.0 as we understand it right now are remote pilots, so drones. Drones are the fastest growing manoeuvring thing on the planet. Like it's remotely controlled, inverted commas, um, but it's, it's an air platform that can do all sorts of things. It can look, it can listen, it can deliver, like it's a mobile flying truck. Um, most air passenger vehicles now are capable of being drones. There's no real reason why 747s need pilots, etc. But in real terms, our pass on the planet, now there are 192 sovereign states. 90 of them have rules controlling drones. That means 50% of the world has uncontrolled airspace for fucking flying robots. So that's a significant proportion of the population that doesn't know what's flying above their heads. So for unscrupulous data operators that are looking to exploit populations, you can do whatever the fuck you want because you can't be stopped. So you, you so effectively like, fly around and just skim data. Yep, completely. So what are the opportunities? I mean, apart from... Uh, what what are the opportunities for industry for right. this stuff? That's correct. But yeah, let's talk about opportunities. So, firstly, let's look at the tenants. So, if you want to, if you want to extrapolate your business, if you want to expand your business in real time, you're no longer physically um, harnessed to uh, delivering goods or services. So, if you deliver a good. You can use the industry 4.0 principles to know where your, you know, your supply chain looks like. So a 4PL supply chain, where is my shit, where, when is it getting here? But if you're delivering a service, um, you can deliver a service uh, unless it's a physical transaction, massage. Um, if you're doing most things, sorry, there's something banging outside my lounge. <laughs> I'll tell you well, if someone comes in behind you. No, it's something in the roof. I think it's the, I think it's a rat in the roof. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, all good. So, I guess to get to back back to my point, if you're delivering a service that doesn't require physical interaction, you can do it around the world. So you can deliver a good and you can deliver a service. So that's a change. That's an opportunity. So if you have an online business, you have the world as your oyster and you have the world in your oyster in real time. Yeah. I mean, it, it, sounds, it, it, it sounds deceptively simple. Well, not, not simple, but the, it's so easy to explain that it's almost like you miss the potential scale of it, especially you know, in the context of a service. It's not just who can you interact with in your local community anymore. It's sort of, well, if you've been on social media, you know how big that community can potentially be. And it's sort of, I guess it can open you up to a whole bunch of markets that you just never would have thought to be able to get your fingers in before. 
completely. If if all you need to do is get your brand in front of people, then use platforms to get brand in front of people. Amazon, Shopify, Shopmate, doesn't matter. If if all you want to do is um, get a service in front of people so they go, yes, I want to engage with this individual, then it's simply about volume. And there's that's a piece of piss. I mean, you can automate that search engine optimization process now. You know, you can you can build you can build a silent website in behind, which is blank, nobody ever sees, but it just spams the algorithms. You know, if you put in certain keywords on your product or service, whatever it is, people come to you. I should figure out it's how to do that. Business. You can pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> people, people are providing that service. That's the point. Yeah. That's the opportunity. Yeah. So what are the, I mean, are there, is there anything, is there any low-hanging fruit that we're sort of ignoring with this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are. So I know you asked me before this uh, discussion about what they are. So the first thing is no ifs, no buts. You need to have an online presence. People need to see you because as soon as you're online, you can be seen globally. That's a start, which means somebody can reach into you to ask you a question about your product or service. Um, secondly, is the use of the principles to speed your life up. If you think that there are things you are doing in your job or your work or your life that you shouldn't be doing, like process-wise, answering emails, phone calls, administration tasks, it's quite likely there are software or processes that will do it for you. So you can remove that from you because you is a finite time, 24 hours a day, and depending on how you work, you chunk that into 24 bits and someone pays you a chunk of thing per hour. The value in your time becomes exponential. So if anybody wants to know what exponential increase looks like, have a look at the story of Jeff Bezos and Amazon and understand how his effort was magnified, the, the, the very version of compound interest that people talk about, oh, yeah, that was awesome. You know, that's compound interest on SMAP. So same effort multiplied by a million times. So if you do it once, the software and all hardware can do it everywhere. So find ways to replicate yourself through the systems and finally, um, find smart networks, find alliances, find if you're good at something and someone else is good at something, share. Because you could have a, a virtual company that is distributed around the world that doesn't necessarily be in the same space, but for all the world, for intents and purposes, people see multiple entities, like you see a larger company than what it physically is on the ground. It's, it seems like there's a lot to tap into that just ha like li listening to you talk about and thinking, well, my, like if I want to recruit someone, my job market isn't just the people who are near to me anymore. Really, I mean, it, I guess that introduces other problems because I've got so much more potential input from all around the world rather than my local area. Um yeah, I would just, it's sort of boggling my mind at the moment just thinking about what that means for um, opportunity and, I guess, competition as well. You know, when your job market is now the high, potentially, if you, if you can exploit it correctly, um, is potentially the entire world. Um, you've just got to find a way to get access to it or someone's got to create that um, portal that you can go through to get access yep. to it. Yep. Once again, you can automate a lot of that stuff. So if you build a website, there are um, uh, website translators that will build you replicas in various languages. Um, most of the website developers out there, out there will give you multiple languages. Um, so if you pick, and the goal is, depending on your market, is what you do is you build your website in the majority of your market. You know? And to be honest, if you did... English, Spanish, and possibly fucking uh, Chinese, you'll dominate 60% of the planet. Why? Because English, Spanish, and Chinese dominate 60% of the planet. Yeah. So, so you don't need all the variants. 
you, you just need the core. Because if you speak Spanish, by the way, you speak to a billion people. Speak English, you speak to most of the people. If you speak Chinese, you speak to at least 1.5 billion Chinese and then everyone else. Yeah, and you So you pick up a significant chunk just by having several versions of a website. And I've got to say, if you're an individual player, you probably can't service 60% of the world's population. Yeah. That's, that's just for example. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking with uh, the subsequent links in that chain as well. I mean, if you say you create a website in Spanish, you've obviously got Spain, you've probably got Portugal, you've probably got other nearby countries in Europe, and then you've got an enormous wow. amount of South America, and most of those people will be bilingual. So you get a significant proportion of America, all of Mexico, and all of South America. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And every, and about a third of Europe, minimum. Yeah. So you think, you know, you combine traditional marketing and then reference selling on top of that. The, yeah, sure. The, yeah, you get exponential growth or at least the potential for it. Um, what are the threats? Is there anything we need to be worried about with it? Or is it just uh, not yeah. being fast enough? Uh, no, there are genuine threats here and there are genuine metaphysical threats. So the biggest threat here is artificial intelligence. Um, so, And when I say threats, the threat to your market or your product or your service or to some extent your humanity is the fact that in generations to come, a significant component of your work you won't be doing. So the human experience will change over the next 30 years. Um, so the threat is what does work look like? In the decades to come, if if we have kids now, what, are the, what do they teach their kids in 20 to 30 years? Because it's a shift. Like in 10 years, our life changed with smartphones. Yeah, massive. Imagine what it's going what it's going to be like in 30 years' time. I mean, is work, work like potentially that? going to be that bigger part of people's lives in 30 years' time? Or are we going to have to look for, we're actually going to have to work to find some form of fulfilment rather than just sort of, you know, head down, oh, head down, ass up, working through a job? So this is where the concepts of universal basic income income support and other societal welfare measures come into play because at some point the government doesn't have a tax income um, to support humans living if their fucking robots have replaced, you know, 15, 20% of your economy. That's a potentially enormous problem. Yep. Right? I, mean, I, 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 I can't think of anything that wouldn't touch. It's not yep, just correct. work, it's politics, political systems, money. Jeez. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, I mean, daunting would be a hopeful way to look at it, but it's, it's kind of scary. Yes, they, yeah. they are significant issues. And we sort of verge into the realm of ethical and moral decision-making here. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, almost just as murky. I mean, you, I guess you end up back with, you know, how do you drive an ought from an is? And people have been looking at that for at least 2,000 years and still trying to work out what the answer is if there is one at all. Yep. Look, so they, that's, that, that are the threats, Sam. That, that the ethical moral um, implications of artificial intelligence is the, is the single most worrisome problem that humans should face. Yeah. But it sounds like there's still a fair bit to be excited about in the meantime. There's significant opportunity. Um, if you're in a job that requires phys full physical labour, your physical job is at threat. Um, if you could get off your ass and understand what's coming next, you probably have longevity. If you don't, you're out of the gig. Yeah. That's, to be blunt, and it's going to happen much faster than people expect. Well, it's like... Uh, just, sorry, mate, I, I want... I want to articulate COVID-19 is the perfect example of stopping economy and restarting it under under different conditions. Absolutely. So, so this is the this is almost like a high speed reset of how your economy works. Yeah, I mean, not you, everyone not everyone's coming back. 
you've seen, uh, at least locally here, um, you know, schools got shut down and anyone that didn't have some form of distance or digital learning set up was in trouble. And the first thing I thought of was every few years I'll look to see what courses are available at the ANU and I've never seen anything online for them. And for one of the most for one of the premier universities in the country, not to be using that resource doesn't say anything good about them. And then this has happened. And it's like, well, it's I, I can't remember what is what it was exactly, but I remember uh, Machiavelli in the Prince talking about deal with your problems now, because if you put them off, you'll be forced to deal them when you're you'll be forced to deal with them when you're least prepared. And that was exactly the position that they got put in there. Like, well, we've got two weeks. We've got to come up with something. Is it going to work? I don't know. We've never done this before. And yet University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba has 35,000 students. They don't have a 35,000-person campus. Yeah, that's that's something that probably excites me about it more than anything else is that maybe universities can be less administration and more university. Um, yeah, that's that's exciting. So not just universities, by the way. So private enterprises, education deliverers, individuals, you could have, there is no reason why an individual, and there are right now through influencers and YouTube and subscription channels, um, you could have a multi-million subscriber base um, and as an individual. You could do that on YouTube. You could do it on Instagram. You can do it right now. I could We're probably spend spend 10 minutes and, and give you five right now. And they're getting paid incredibly well to deliver information through social media. Now, if you go formal, there's a shit ton of deliveries, everything from Amazon and Amazon Prime through to Skillshare through to others who are delivering and Google Prime and others who are delivering chunks of content or long content in in a format which is acceptable to people to learn and understand. Yeah. So universities, schools, vocational education institutions and the rest around the world, they either A, change their model or B, they will become defunct and the only people who do face-to-face are the physical trades who mandate physical skills. That's it. Look, I'm running out of time at my end. Um, are you yeah. happy to pause this and we'll come back another time and keep talking? Because I'm not even sure if I got to half of what I wanted to talk about, but it was good. <laughs> I enjoyed what yeah, we sure. got to. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, do it again. Awesome. Be Thanks. Good. Look, um, before we go, I just wanted to – um, say thanks for coming on, having a chat to us, um, and thanks for your uh, friendship and advice over the last 15 years. People won't see it, but behind the scenes, you probably uh, have more to do with turning my average ideas into better ideas than most other people, and you know, I, I really appreciate it, so thanks. Mate, it, it's been my pleasure. I'm, uh, anything I can do to, to help? I'm happy to give it a shot. So my only my only word of advice, mate, is the same thing. It's the same principles I just described about. Um, if you want this to uh, continue on, subscribe to them. Is use the principles. If you if you don't need to do it, don't do it. Find ways to uh, multiply your effort. Thanks for listening and thanks to Dan for a great conversation. Um, If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing so you don't miss future content. Um, If you want to check out what Dan's doing, head over to symbotics.com.au and that's spelled S-I-M-B-O-T-I-X. If you've got any questions or comments for me, you can find me on Twitter at critical underscore coach, on Facebook at the critical coach, all one word and on Instagram as the underscore critical underscore coach. Bye.